Hey everybody, it's Tony from Adafruit, and I wanted to do a stream on the Circuit Playground, so another stream to show off an interesting demo that I just made for it. So I call it the Mega Demo, because I took a whole bunch of smaller demos and kind of smushed them all together into one big demo that you can change the different demos uh, with different button presses. So we'll just kind of dive into it. I'll show you kind of what the sketch does, all the different demos that it can do, and then uh, we'll walk through the code a little bit and kind of see how I implemented it and how I tried to make it a little bit more extensible so that you can add in extra demos and things and show you an interesting way that uh, you might not have realized you can use the Arduino IDE. You can actually create like separate files and include those. So I broke out all these multiple sketches into smaller files that are all included into one main sketch. Uh, so we'll kind of walk through that and see how it goes. So first, let's just dive in and I'll show you the demos. Um, let's see, so let's switch to kind of the workbench view here. So right here is uh, Circuit Playground Board and it's running uh, the mega demo. And I'll put a link in the description below to the demo. It's actually an example inside the Adafruit Circuit Playground library. So if you install that library, make sure to grab the latest version uh, from the uh, library manager in Arduino. I just uploaded it, so it'll probably take like a day to get there. Uh, but basically, if you load up the mega demo and install it, uh, and then you also need to install it needs the Sleepy Dog library, which I'll, which I'll put a link to in the description when this is up on YouTube also. Uh, so that's a little dependency, because I'll show you it actually can use the deep sleep mode of the chip to save power. Uh, but once you run it, so it starts out and it just goes into kind of the classic, the rainbow cycle, uh, NeoPixel animation. Now the cool thing with the demo, so the way I've set it up, the left uh, push button right here, this will change which demo you're viewing. So there are, um, let's see, I think there's five different demos that I put in here. Um, yeah, there's five demos in here. So this will uh, kind of ratchet through all five of the demos when you press the left button. The right button will change the mode of the current demo. And each demo has a different concept of mode. So like some demos might just have like, you know, one or two different modes. Other demos might like change, you know, the speed of animation, for example. So like with the NeoPixel one, when I press the right button, it changes the animation speed. It actually slows it down. Uh, and I think there are four levels of speed. So you can see this one's a little bit slower. And then I press it again and, you know, it's, it's pretty slow. I think there's one more level. So yeah, this is like really slow. It's like real nice kind of slow animation. You can see kind of the red one slowly moving around down here. And then uh, once it gets back to the start, if you press it again, it just loops through all different speed values. So there's four different speeds here. So it's kind of neat. It's, you know, it's a good way to, to show off uh, some of the pixel animation that you can do with this. So that's one demo, kind of the classic, you know, the NeoPixel um, color uh, rainbow cycle, I think is the name. So, you know, something that uh, every time you use strand test, uh, it's kind of the coolest demo. So I'll press the left button and we'll go into the next mode. So this mode might look kind of familiar. This is actually doing the volume meter that I did a stream on a, a while back. Uh, so this, you can see as I'm talking, it's picking up, the microphone is picking up the volume of my voice and it lights up more and more LEDs the louder I go. So if I talk really loudly, then you see it kind of peaks up to a high level here and then falls back down. So kind of cool, like, you know, you can just switch into this VU meter mode, really great demo of the microphone, you know, shows you what you can do. Now the mode in this one, this will switch the sensitivity of the uh, microphone. So it, it starts out at kind of a medium sensitivity. And then when you press it again, it goes up to a very low sensitivity. So it's picking up, um, you know, like a wider range of values. So you can see as I'm talking, it's not lighting up as much just because it can handle a lot louder values before it kind of hits the, the max limit there. And if I press the mode again, now it's in a more sensitive mode. So I'm talking at the same level, but you can see it's kind of lighting up, you know, almost half the pixels there. Uh, and then if I press it again, it kind of goes back to the default mode. So I just wanted to put in some different ranges there because, you know, you might be in a loud environment, soft environment, uh, and just kind of tweak how it works. Uh, and it's real simple, easy change to the sketch. We just kind of change the expected range of input values inside of here. So that's the VU meter demo. Uh, let's see, let's go to the next one. So this one, uh, the third demo, doesn't look like it's doing anything, but it's actually a capacitive touch kind of color organ or color instrument. 
So if I press some of the capacitive touch keys, you can see the uh, pixel lights up that's next to the, the capacitive touch input there. Like I can press two of them, like those two, and it's doing the rainbow colors. Now you might see this middle LED right here, this never lights up because this is the ground pad. So that's not a capacitive touch input. It's only uh, these pins, these two, and then these two down here, and then the same ones on the other side of the board. So these two and those two light up. And it's kind of cool. I mean, you can light up multiple ones, you know, on different sides here, like it's showing multiple at once. Now, the cool thing is when you press the mode button, now it's going to play a tone and it actually plays a scale of music. So I can start with like this one and I, you might hear this. Let's see. Let's I'll hold a hold it closer to the kind of microphone area here. You might hear this. So I'm going to press uh, press one of the buttons. So you can kind of hear. So it plays different tones. Um, and let's see, I'll put this back so we can kind of see. Oops. Uh, so basically make sound, uh, you know, you can press each of these like, like a little piano, basically uh, it plays the C4 scale. So you can play pretty much all uh, eight notes in that scale. Uh, no sharps or flats or anything, but you could do like some songs and things. You could connect alligator clips to this and, you know, connect it to a piece of fruit and do the classic fruit organ kind of demo. Uh, and then if you don't want the sound, press the mode again, and it goes back to just kind of silent mode where it only lights up uh, the pixels for it. So real good, easy kind of little demo to showcase the capacitive touch sensor. Uh, well, not sensor, but actually, you know, the components we've used to do capacitive touch on uh, Circuit Playground. So really easy kind of quick little demo of that. So, okay, so let's do the third demo. So I press this, and now this is a demo of the accelerometer. It's like a tilt demo where it uses the accelerometer right in the middle of the board, and it's gonna light up all the pixels the same color, but it's gonna interpolate the color between red and blue, depending on the value of an accelerometer axis. So it starts out with the X axis, which is basically the axis that goes this way on the board. And you can actually see uh, printed right next to the accelerometer is a little X, Y, Z kind of arrow. So the X axis goes this way. So when the x-axis is at negative 10 meters per second squared, uh, then it's going to be, uh, I believe, blue. And if it's at 10 meters per second squared, then it's going to be red. And if it's somewhere in between there, then it's going to be, you know, like a pinkish color. So in between red and blue. So because this is the x-axis, if I make the x-axis face this direction, you can kind of see, and it's, it's hard to tell because I can't move the camera, but it turns more red as I tilt it this way because now the x-axis is facing down with gravity, which is giving a good kind of almost 10 meters per second squared uh, acceleration. And so then it turns red because it's seeing, you know, a positive 10 meters per second. And if I turn it around this way, the opposite way, you can see it turns blue. And that's because now the x-axis is flipped around and it's actually kind of going up towards the camera, like where you're looking. But that means it's seeing a negative 10 meters per second squared uh, force of gravity coming against it. And so, and as you move in between these, it, it kind of, you know, goes between blue and red colors basically for it. So a really cool little demo to show, you know, here's what you can do with tilting uh, with the accelerometer and looking at the axis. Now the right button, the mode, this will change which axis is being uh, used to calculate kind of this color value. So if I press it once, now it's looking at the Y axis, which goes this way. So now if I tilt the board left and right, you can see as I go this way, it's starting to turn red. And if I go this way, it turns blue. And so, and, you know, if I change this way, it's not really doing anything because I'm only moving across the X axis. And But, you know, I'm looking at the Y axis. So again, a cool little demo of the uh, accelerometer. And then if I press it one more time, uh, now it's reading the Z axis, which is actually going up and down, like into the camera right now. So in this orientation, it's blue because basically, you know, gravity's pushing against it. And if I flip it over, which you're not going to see, but you can kind of see it's lighting up red uh, in the reflection there. So, you know, now the gravity is, is positive with it. So, and then if I press it again, it just goes back to the X axis again for the demo. So again, cool little demo of uh, the accelerometer. You know, trying to give you an intuitive way to kind of play with it and understand how it works and uh, really that you're seeing the, the, the force of, gra of gravity. So good for like basic kind of tilt detection. You know, you can't detect like, here's the exact location in space, uh, you know, just with this accelerometer. But uh, it gives you, I think, enough uh, kind of flexibility to do some cool stuff with this, like, you know, change colors, change sounds. Uh, the 20 sided die project, the talking 20 sided die, just used a simple accelerometer like this one to detect, you know, when it lands, like which orientation is it facing? You know, is it like this? Is it like this? Is it tilted a little bit? 
to figure out which uh, side of the dice is facing down and then uh, say the, the number there. So you could do a similar thing with this. It wouldn't be able to talk, but uh, you know, you can maybe light up uh, the number of pixels or something like that, that it's uh, facing. So, okay, so that's the accelerometer demo. And then the last demo, if I press this, uh, this is an analog sensor demo. So this is showing off the temperature and the light sensor on the board. So this half, the right half of the board with these red pixels, these are lit up based on the amount of light hitting the light sensor, which is kind of right in front of my finger here. And if I kind of cover it up, you see if I move my finger over the light sensor, it's uh, turning off some of the LEDs. So, you know, we're changing the value of that and that changes how many LEDs are lit up. And then the other half of the board, which you don't see anything lit up right now, that's actually the temperature sensor. So there's a little thermistor right here on, on the side, but my finger's on top of it. Now I'm gonna try to heat it up, um, but you don't really see much. And that's because I set it up so by default in, in its starting mode, it has like a really small range of values. And so right now it's just too cold in this room for it to pick up uh, the, the temperature. Now, if I press the mode button, that actually increases the range of values. So it's looking at a wider range of temperatures. And now you can see it's kind of flashing on and off, sort of like right at the point of it starting to, uh, to look at the temperature. And I think, let me look at my ranges that I set for this one. Uh, so by default, it starts, it looks at the range of 80 to 85 degrees. And then when I press the button, now it's looking at the range of 70 to 90 degrees. And this is Fahrenheit. So, you know, it's, it's almost 70 degrees in this room, but if I hold my finger on the sensor, on the, uh, on the uh, temperature sensor here, I might be able to heat it up. So, you know, kind of see, like it's flashing a little bit. So it's, it's pretty cold in this room. I guess it must be around like the mid sixties or so. Uh, and then uh, if I press it again, now it's in a really wide mode where it's looking from negative 32 to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So from like freezing to boiling water, uh, which we're, we're not gonna test dumping this in water. Don't, don't put your circuit playground in water, but you can see now it lights up a few more. So, you know, this is two pixels out of five lit up. So that's like two fifths of the way between that range, which sounds about right. It's, you know, somewhere in the 60 degree range. And I doubt I'll be able to light it up, uh, you know, by holding my finger here, because the, the range is so wide. Uh, but and you can see also the uh, the light sensor is changing its sensitivity too. So each button press is increasing the range of sensitivity. And so like right now it's so large that uh, you know the just the ambient light in my room isn't bright enough to turn on some of the dots uh, that, that light it up. But if I press this again, it goes back to the the low sensitivity, and you can kind of see. So as I cover up, you know, if I add a little bit of shadow here, and if I go again one more button press, so now you know it's higher sensitivity on the light sensor. And so I can cover it up, but it doesn't light up as much. Uh, so it's, you know, if I got something really bright, uh, well, I don't have a flashlight handy, but you know, if you, if you shine a light on there, then you'll light up more of these for it. So cool little demo, you know, just kind of showing off some of the analog sensors here and, and what you can do, like what's on the board, basically. Uh, some real basic kind of physical computing things uh, to play with on Circuit Playground. And I wanted it all to be in one demo so that, uh, you know, I could just kind of have a circuit playground and show people this is what you can do. You know, it's a, it's a good little basic demo. Uh, the one other thing, let's see, oh, and if I press the mode button again, it's gonna go back to the first mode. So the NeoPixel mode, uh, the, the rainbow cycle. Now, the one thing I haven't mentioned though is uh, it has deep sleep support. So the slide switch down here, when this slide switch is on the left, like it is right now, so there's a plus sign on the left, um, then it basically it's, it turns on and it's you know it's running its full demo. When I move the slide switch to the right to the negative, you can see it turns off, or at least it looks like it turns off. And what's happening is the chip it's actually going into deep sleep, so that it's uh, using as little power as possible. Like the processor is not running your code anymore; it's just it's kind of sitting waiting to activate. Um, I'll show you how it works in the code. So it sleeps for a second, and then it wakes up and it checks to see if the switch is still turned off. And if it is, then it goes back to sleep. But then if I slide the switch back over, it turns back on and it goes back to whatever mode it was last in. So, you know, I could go into like the uh, volume level mode and then put it into sleep and then take it out of sleep. And you'll see it goes back into the volume mode and it's, you know, just operating just like normal. And it's pretty cool. And I, I actually, I measured the current and in deep sleep like this, it's pulling about uh, five milliamps of power. Now my board, uh, I have a, an LED that's broken right here, this little power LED. Uh, so that might, on your board, it might actually be running and you'd probably be pulling a little bit of current from that. So somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10 milliamps of current probably uh, for this, which is pretty low. Uh, now when it's running in the full mode, uh, 
for example, like, you know, the volume meter, this level is not too power taxing because it's just lighting up a few pixels. You know, basically your NeoPixels are what pull most of your power. And the, uh, the little buzzer, the speaker actually pulls a decent amount of power also. Uh, so if you're not using those, you're not going to pull as much power. But in like the, uh, the rainbow cycle animation mode, like this mode, it pulls around um, 25 milliamps of current. So from 25 down to like 5 to 10 milliamps of current, that's a good, decent change. Uh, if you have like a 2000 milliamp hour battery, I think I calculated out, it would run for like 13 days in deep sleep. Uh, before exhausting the battery. So it's kind of handy. You know, you can just slide the switch over and turn it off, quote unquote, because it still is running. It still keeps the memory of the chip active. Uh, you know, it still is pulling some power for this. But uh, that's basically all the demo uh, as far as like what it does. Now what we'll do is uh, I'll jump into the code and I'll show you how I structured the demo and how you can kind of see how it works. So let's change the view. Let's go to the desktop. Uh, oops, turn that on. There we go. So then up in the corner here, just got the circle playing around and on the desktop here. So I've got the mega demo. So like I said, this is a part of the uh, library. It's an example in the circuit playground library. So if you go into there and you should see the mega demo and just make sure to update your library. Uh, if you have an older version, I, I just added this. So in the next day, it should be in the library manager. Uh, when you open it up, it kind of tells you a little bit about it here. So it says, you know, it shows multiple demos. Uh, it does mention, so you do need to install this Adafruit Sleepy Dog library. And so you can use the library manager for this. So if you do include library, manage libraries, and then search for Sleepy, then you should see this library here. So make sure to install this. And I'll show you why we need this. So I use this for the sleep functionality. Uh, but it talks about, you know, here are the different modes that it has, the, the demos, and a little bit about each of the modes inside of there. Now, the way that I structured this, so, you know, you can imagine, as you saw, there are five different demos in here. That's a lot of different demos. You know, I've got like the volume level meter, the accelerometer demo. If I jam all of that into one file, it's going to be really complex. You could break it down. You could have like a function, you know, here's the main loop for the volume meter demo uh, versus here's a function for the main loop for like the NeoPixel rainbow cycle. That would be a smart way to do it because then you've just got a separate function for each of your main loops. And then in your sketches main loop, it can pick, okay, you know, I'm in rainbow cycle mode. So I'm going to call this function uh, for that. So that, that's a good way to structure it because an alternative, a really bad way to structure it would be like have one big loop function with a big case statement, you know, switch statements with a bunch of cases in there for like, if I'm in this mode, do this set of code. You know, it's, it's not bad. It, it would work. It's just the problem is, You've got a really complex uh, switch statement that's you know going to be multiple pages long. It's going to be really easy to get lost inside of there. And when you want to add a new mode, you might not realize you know you might mess up the syntax or things like that. So I'll show you how I broke this apart. I basically I uh, kind of approached it with uh, an object orientation hat on and, and looked at you know how we could separate out like what is a demo and what are the different things that a demo needs to do. Uh, and so the way that I did that is I created this abstract demo class. And so this might be kind of advanced if you're not familiar with C++ and classes and object-oriented programming. It, I don't go too deep into it because there are some limits uh, as far as what you want to do on little embedded platforms. Uh, but just, you know, word of the wise, this is maybe a little more advanced than most Arduino sketches. But it's uh, something where, you know, if you're, if you're starting to learn more about programming, this could be really helpful to, to see how I've structured it here. But I basically created uh, effectively an interface. So an interface is like a class that defines uh, a contract of functions and you know things that a, a, a class should implement. So this contract or this interface is basically saying that each of my demo instances needs to have a loop function. So this virtual void loop equals zero. This is a pure virtual function in C++, which basically means that anything that inherits from this demo class has to provide an implementation of this loop function. And the compiler will actually check that so that if I make, you know, some fancy new demo and I forget to add a loop function, it won't even let me compile the sketch. It's going to say, hey, you didn't implement the loop function. So, you know, that's why this is kind of a contract or an interface, because something that implements this demo class needs to make sure that it implements these functions. And the reason I do that is because in my main sketch, now my setup and my loop code can just operate on a generic demo class. So, you know, I import the demo header that has this class. And I actually, I keep a list of demo instances. 
And then uh, I pick, okay, you know, here's the current demo that I'm running. Like it starts out with the rainbow cycle. And then in the main loop, when it wants to call the main loop for that, it actually just takes that demo object and calls its loop function right here. And you, this might look like a little weird syntax if you're not used to pointers, uh, but basically I have a pointer to a demo class. And you know, even though that demo class implements this crazy rainbow function, you know, the way that object orientation works in C++ like this, I've effectively said, okay, I've got some demo object, and all I know about it is that it has a function called loop that takes no parameters and returns nothing, and it also has a function called mode press that has no parameters and returns nothing. And just with that knowledge, my main function, my, my main loop code in my sketch, that's all it needs to know for the compiler to be okay. You know, the comp compiler is basically saying, okay, uh, I'm going to run whatever the active demo is. I'm going to call its loop function. And I won't know until I've actually run this sketch because, you know, the current demo is going to change as I press the button. It's going to increment this current demo index and it's going to pick a different uh, demo inside this list. But it, it still knows that all of the objects inside of this list at least have a loop function that it can call. They might have other functions and all kinds of other stuff, but I can't get to that because as far as I know, these are just, you know, pure demo objects in here. So it's kind of a weird distinction, and especially early on uh, in programming, it takes a while before it really clicks and before you understand like why you break things out, um, why you use this is called polymorphism, you know, where an object uh, can look like one type of thing and have different different implementations. So it's, it's kind of a weird uh, thing to, to understand or wrap your head around as a beginner. But as you, as you use it more and as you learn more about uh, these kind of structures and, and ways to implement programs, it starts to make a little more sense because now I've effectively done what I mentioned before. I said, you know, I could just have a bunch of separate loop functions. Like here's my rainbow cycle loop, here's my volume meter loop function. And then in my main loop code here, you know, I could have a big case statement or switch statement that says, okay, if I'm in rainbow mode, call my rainbow loop function. That's basically what this line is doing. Just that code for that switch statement, the compiler created. So the compiler internally knows like, okay, I've got some demo class instance and I'm gonna call its loop function. And there's actually a little table inside of each of these classes that says, okay, here's the loop function for this class. And so I'll show you an implementation. So this uh, rainbow cycle demo.h, and, and you might notice there are a bunch of tabs at the top. These are separate files that are inside of this sketch. So and again, a new thing in Arduino that you might not have seen as much. Uh, you can actually, if you go down to this little menu item that's uh, not very noticeable, but you can create a new tab, which creates a new file, and you can kind of you know manage all the files inside of here. So like we were looking at this demo.h file, and then if we look at one of the examples, so the rainbow.h, or rainbow cycle demo.h, this one implements this demo class here. So it imports the demo class, it implements it. And the important thing is here's where it has its loop implementation. So this is where I have the code that does the actual rainbow cycle animation. And the nice thing is, you know, this function implementation lives inside of this class, which lives in its own file. It can have its own global variables inside of here. It can have whatever state it needs, which is totally separate from all the other demos. So I can work on this in isolation. You know, I can make this demo work and I won't be worried that, oh, you know, if I mess up some syntax, it's gonna screw up all the other demos because they're not in the same file. You know, if, if something's wrong in this file, it's just gonna affect this demo. So it's a, a very powerful, um, um, you know, concept of just breaking your code apart, keeping things simple and small, easy to digest kind of chunks. Like you can see, you know, this function, it's only maybe six or seven lines long. So it's pretty easy to understand this and glance at it versus, you know, if I had some giant loop function where that was like, you know, some sub case statement inside of a mega switch statement, it'd be really hard to figure out what's going on here. So that's why I broke it apart. It might, might seem unnecessary, uh, but that's my rationale here is that I want to have a lot of different demos. I want to be able to easily add new demos. And I think this kind of structure makes it work pretty well for it. Uh, so, okay, so I showed you the demo class and you can see it has a loop function and a mode press. And basically what happens in my main sketch loop here, uh, I look to see, uh, we'll come back to this. This is where it does the sleep logic. But basically I look to see if you did any button presses. So if you press the left or the right button, and I do that just kind of the classic way I've shown in a bunch of sketches where I take an initial reading, I delay for a small period, I actually run the main loop of the current demo, and then I take another button press reading. So I have two readings of the button. 
Uh, and then if I see if it changes between the first and the second press, like if it was at a high level and it goes down to a low level, then I know, you know, the button must have been pressed at this point or actually released at this point. Uh, because when the button's pressed, it stays at a high level. And when it's released, it goes back to a low level. Uh, so that's what I look for down in this bit of code here is I say, okay, uh, look for each button press. So look at the left button first and see, you know, was the initial reading at a high level and then was it at a low level here, which means it was pressed and then released. And if that happens, then I know, okay, you press the left button, so you must want to switch the mode. And I basically, I turn off all the pixels because I just want to clean up after the previous mode. You know, it might have been animating all the pixels. So I turn off all the pixels, and then I just increase this count that I keep of what's my current demo. And I have to make sure to constrain it to be within the uh, uh, kind of the number of demos that I have. And so as I showed before, uh, one of the global variables that I have here is basically I have this demo array and it's an array of demo pointers. So that's what this star syntax means. So it's, 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 uh, it's basically, you know, a, a pointer is like a value that points at another location in memory. So it's a kind of indirect way to access an object because I wouldn't want to like copy around different instances of this demo class. There's only one instance of this rainbow cycle demo class uh, that's actually created right above here. And then I just grab a pointer to it with this little kind of ampersand syntax here. So again, a little bit advanced, uh, but if you're starting to begin uh, like C++ and object-oriented programming, this will probably start to look a little familiar. But basically I keep an array of all of these demos. So if I wanna add a new demo, I just need to add a new instance of uh, the demo uh, class here. And it could be anything. It could be, I could add another rainbow demo if I wanted, you know, if I wanted to have rainbow cycle demo twice in here, I could do it. It'd be kind of weird, but you could do something like that. Uh, oops, oh, I just pressed uh, the end key, selected everything. Uh, but so that, that's what I wanted. I wanted it to be easy to add new demos here. Uh, and then, uh, oops, I just pressed the save, but uh, I'm not gonna save this. Ah, uh, cancel out of that. So that's, that's what's happening here. I'm basically checking to see, uh, and this syntax is a little weird. I'm using the size of operator, the size of that demos array divided by the size of a single demo pointer. This is effectively telling me how many items are inside the demo array because the size of operator gives you the number of bytes that an object takes in memory. And so this demos array, it's, it's an array of pointers. So this demo star, uh, object and so I'm basically saying okay take the total size in memory of this entire demo list demo pointer list and divide it by the size of a single pointer uh, demo pointer and then that'll tell you okay if there are 10 demos you know you're gonna get 10 back from this result and I could have just hard-coded this in and said you know hey there's only five demos inside of here uh, but I wanted to be a little more dynamic because like I said I'd like to just you know do comma here's a new demo here's a new demo after that just add my demos onto this list and it'll figure out automatically just by taking the size of this in memory uh, and figuring out you know what's the the total number of demos inside of here so and it, then it just makes sure that once I go beyond the fifth demo it wraps back down to the first demo so it'll set the current demo to zero and it'll even print out a little serial message here but this is nice so that all of my left button press logic is in my main function my loop function so none of my demo code like you know my rainbow cycle here's its loop function it doesn't have to know or care about how to read that left mouse or uh, left uh, button press on the circuit playground board so you know all of that logic it's in my mega demo loop so all of my little sub demos don't have to do that. It's, you know, that code lives in one spot. So again, real nice, smart way to uh, uh, do a program like this so that you've just got your logic in one spot and you're not copying this into all of your main loop functions. Uh, so that's the left button press. And then I do the exact same thing for the right button press. Uh, you know, I look for when it goes from a high to a low value, like when I release my finger from it. And this time I just take the current demo and I call its mode press function. So you saw that in the interface, this mode press function that all the demos have to implement. And uh, it's up to the each demo, sub demo, to figure out what it wants to do. You know, this is basically just an event that happens. It's saying, you know, hey, the user pressed the mode button, go do whatever you want to do. So, you know, a demo, it might do nothing if it has no modes, or if it wants to ratchet through like different speed values, it could do that inside of its demo. And that's really all that the, the main sketch does here. You know, it just looks for the left button and the uh, right button press, and then calls the main loop of the current demo inside of there. Now at the very top, you might've seen this code. This is where I do the sleep logic. So when I change the slide switch and it goes to sleep. Uh, and so what I'm doing, basically I'm using the sleepy dog library that I mentioned. So uh, it has a, it's basically an abstraction on top of uh, sleep, like using the watchdog as a deep sleep timer 
or as like a kind of reliability measure where it can restart the uh, processor if, if it locks up and you know it goes into an infinite loop. But I'm just using it for the deep sleep because in a lot for a lot of chips you can get the deepest sleep mode if you turn on the watchdog timer to uh, you know basically the the chip will turn off like all of the clocks except for the watchdog timer clock you know turn off everything that might be consuming power just leave the bare minimum stuff running like only enough power to keep the memory at the same state you know so you don't actually lose the the data that's in memory and then enough power to run like the watchdog timer and then it's set up it takes in how many milliseconds that it should sleep for and this is just kind of an estimate so it depends on each chip like you know, I think the 80 mega chip that this uh, board uses can only sleep in powers of two up to like eight seconds or something like that. But I basically say, okay, sleep for up to a second. It might sleep for less than this amount of time. And so effectively, while it's in this sleep mode, no other code is running. And when it's done sleeping, it's actually just going to continue on, you know, right here on this line below. And I put this inside of a loop. So basically, I'm checking the loop. If it's uh, if this slide switch function returns false, which means the slide switch is on the right side, there's a little negative next to that, then it's going to uh, run this main loop or run the code inside of this loop. So it's just going to turn off all the pixels, which, you know, maybe I could be smarter and only turn off these pixels once, like when it detects you go into sleep for the first time. But I don't think it's so bad to, uh, you know, do this clear pixel. Uh, command and so it's going to turn off the pixels and then sleep for a second and when it's done sleeping it's going to go back to the, the top of the loop it's going to check the switch again so it's going to wake up it's you know it's going to go back into full power there's going to be a brief little period of time if you could look at this with like a high speed power monitor you'd probably see like a few millisecond or so blip where it wakes up checks the slide switch it sees it's still on the right side turns off the pixels, which it doesn't do anything, you know, they're turned off already, and then it goes back to sleep. So it tries to spend as much time as possible in this sleep mode, and it's just waking up to check that switch state. And then when I finally do move the switch over, and you kind of notice there, there's a little bit of a delay, and that's because, you know, it's gonna sleep for that second period. And so if I slide that switch over during this sleep, there might be a little bit of a pause there, uh, but it's gonna wake up and then it realizes, okay, now this is uh, not returning false. This is returning true, which means that the switch is on the left side here where there's a little positive sign. And so now it breaks out of this loop and it goes on to actually run the rest of the code here. So a real easy kind of way to add sleep is to, to follow this kind of convention. Um, there are probably better ways in that you could actually configure sleep on the chip so that if, uh, if an input changes value, like if the slide switch digital input changes its value, that could cause it to wake up from sleep mode. And so that would probably be the ideal state where it goes into like a super deep sleep and then only wakes up when it detects that the slide switch input changes state. But, you know, ultimately, I don't think this is so bad of a trade-off because it's it's really just meant to, you know, make a best effort at sleeping and, and keep the code simple. It's, it's not super complex this way. Uh, and it lets you run a little bit longer on battery. And again, the nice thing is this is only in my sketch main loop function here. All of my demos don't have to worry about this at all. You know, they don't know or care that there's a sleep mode and the sleep mode, it'll work in any of the modes. So if I go into, you know, the VU motor mo uh, meter mode or, you know, maybe the uh, uh, accelerometer mode, if I turn it off, it's in deep sleep now, and then I can turn it back on and it'll wake back up uh, in this mode. And, you know, you can change the colors and things here. So it's, uh, it's yeah, real nice and easy, and it's all just in one spot there. So that's all that the main loop does. Uh, it just handles the sleep and handles the button presses. And then each of the demos, so I, I mentioned, you know, I implemented this kind of interface, and all of my demos implement this inter interface. And then I, I threw in a common function, uh, linear interpolation, that a lot of my demos were using this. So I just threw it into this header file because it can be shared across all of these. Uh, so I'll just real quickly dive through the demos here. So the Rainbow Cycle, dem Rainbow, Rainbow Cycle demo, uh, this one is the first demo when it boots up. So it's this demo here. And uh, you can basically see, so I create a Rainbow Cycle, dem Ra Rainbow Cycle demo class, and this inherits from my demo interface. Uh, and this is just the syntax for kind of inheritance in C++. And here's where I actually have to tell it, okay, here's my loop implementation and here's my mode press implementation. And I'm just gonna show you, like if I, uh, let's say I just comment out this entire block, like I, you know, I forgot to implement uh, the mode press. Oops, oh, that's not how I do the mass comment. I think there's a function in Arduino in edit. Yeah, here, there we go, comment. So I can comment this out. Now watch what happens. If I try and compile this, 
uh, you get a build error here. So it's actually saying cannot declare rainbow cycle demo variable of abstract type rainbow cycle demo. Now, unfortunately, this is where C++ is a little prickly. Uh, these error messages are not the best. At least it's better. It used to be a lot worse, but it's kind of telling you, okay, it can't do this because the following vir virtual functions are pure within rainbow cycle, de rainbow cycle demo. So pure virtual means that it has no implementation. It's basically this equals zero. Uh, it'd be nice if this basically said, hey, you forgot to implement this function, but uh, it doesn't say that. It says it's a pure virtual function. So that's C++ for you. Uh, but it's telling me, okay, there's something wrong. You forgot to implement this. And so that's good because you know, if I didn't have this kind of a check, then it, I might forget to implement this and maybe it uses some default implementation that I like had stubbed in or something. So this is nice and that the compiler is doing more work for me. It's doing this uh, verification for me. So that's all good. Uh, and then you can see my rainbow cycle class. So my main code, uh, this is, I've just taken the rainbow cycle demo from uh, kind of the NeoPixel strand test, broken it apart so that it can run uh, kind of quickly, like one one step in, uh, like based on the the millisecond time, the the NeoPixel demo, the strand test demo for color cycle, it's kind of made to work in a loop and use delay. But I broke this apart and said, okay, let's just use the current time in milliseconds. We'll divide it by a speed value to slow it down because I don't want this like cycling through an entire rainbow cycle in a millisecond. You know, I want to be able to see it with my eyes. Uh, so I divide it down uh, integer division so that I, you know, I, I just kind of scale it effectively. And then I just go through and light up the pixels and it uses this color wheel function that changes the hue based on a value uh, between zero and 255. And so I, I change that value as I go around here and then just light up the pixels. So, you know, this effectively does one frame of the uh, rainbow cycle animation here. And then when I press the mode, I just have this little current speed value that I increase and I have an array up here of speed values. And these are just the values that it uses when it divides the milliseconds. So you can see a small value is a faster cycle here. And like if I press this button, now it's using the value of 10. And so you can see it's a little bit slower. And I press it again, and now it's a value 50. And so it's definitely slower. And then one more time, oh, it looks like I was on a different value there. So you know, now it's, the previous one was 100. So now it's on a value of five. So you can see five is pretty fast. And I press it now 10, so it's you know about half as fast for that. And so that that's just basically changing how it divides the current milliseconds. And so if I divide it by a small value, then I get a value that changes pretty quickly. Whereas if I divide it by a large value like 100, you know I'm basically looking at every uh, tenth of a second. Uh, then it's going to do a cycle of animation here. So that's kind of cool, easy way to change the speed. And it's nice in that all of this logic, all of the logic for the rainbow cycle demo, rainbow cycle demo lives in this file. You know, there's no other logic for this demo in other files. So it's all in one spot, easy to see uh, and, and deal with. So that's the rainbow cycle. Um, let's look at the VU meter. So this one's a little more complex. Um, again, though, I just have a class. Uh, there's, there's a lot more stuff in here, so it's kind of hidden. It's a little bit further down. I have my VU meter demo class. It has a loop function, uh, and it also has a mode press function down here. I basically took the VU meter demo from the Circuit Playground library and just jammed it into this file. So it has a bunch of global variables, but that's okay because they're only within the context of this file. I made them static in here. Uh, no other uh, things are going to use them. It, it has a global function, this F scale that I just made a static function because I didn't want to go and like redo all this code and you know I'd, I'd probably messed it up in certain ways. So I just took it and kind of jammed it into the loop uh, function for this. And then I changed it slightly so that I can change the input ceiling value, which is how it changes its sensitivity. So when I'm in the mode right now, you know, it's kind of a moderate sensitivity. And again, same exact idea. I have an array at the top here. And so it starts out with a sensitivity of 500. And it's basically this input ceiling value up here that I've effectively made into a different value. And if I increase it, so now it's using the full range of uh, up to 1023. And so you can see, you know, me talking at a normal level is pretty low. And then if I press it, it goes to a smaller value of 250. And so now it's a smaller ceiling, which means it's more sensitive. Like, you know, if I talk at the normal volume, it's lighting up more of the lights here. 
Uh, so that's really the only change I made to the VU meter sketch. I just put it in here and, and just tweaked it so that I could change it. So you can see in the mode press, exact same thing. You know, I just ratchet through my current ceiling value. And then when I get beyond uh, the end of the array, I go back to the beginning of it so that, it, you know, it starts over at the beginning there. So pretty straightforward uh, and it's nice. You know, it's all of the VU meter code is just in this file. Um, let's see, the next demo was the cap touch one. So this one's more similar to the rainbow cycle, you know, implement the cap touch demo class. It, it implements the demo uh, interface. It's got a loop function. In my loop, basically I turn off all the pixels and then I just go one by one. I check each of the cap touch pins. So like, you know, here's pin three, which is one over here. So if I change the cap touch mode, you know, I can change these buttons here. So it looks to see if they're pressed. Uh, and the way the cap touch works, it gives you back a threshold value, or it gives you back a uh, number of cycles that the signal was high, and you have to pick a threshold. So like a value of 300 is kind of a good value. So if that number of samples that the signal was high is above 300, then it must mean that something is you know touching the, one of the capacitive touch uh, pads on here because it changed the capacitance, uh, changed how long it took that signal to to change. But anyways, I'm just going through for each of those pads and checking to see if they're pressed. And if they are pressed, then I'll just change the color of the nearby pixel for it. So, you know, like the pixel up here, pixel further down, you know, pixels all, all near the, uh, the pads there. And then if I'm in the sound playback mode, I'll play back a tone for a small period of time. So like, uh, you know, the cap touch input two, which I think is uh, this one right here, this is gonna play a 294 hertz tone, which is a D4 tone, if it's in the play sound mode. And the play sound mode, it's again in the mode press function, I just toggle this on and off here. So I'm just basically saying, you know, when you press the mode button, so like if I press it here, now it's gonna say, okay, my play sound value equals the inverse of whatever it was. So if it was false, now it's true. And so it's on now, and so when I press these, it plays back a tone uh, for that. And then if I press the mode button again, uh, you know, it was true and now it turns to false. So it turns off the sound playback for this. So again, real simple and easy. Um, you know, it's only the logic for doing this cap touch demo inside of this file. So very easy to, to look at and understand it. Tilt demo, again, super straightforward. Um, you know, it's tilt demo class implements the loop and the mode functions. In my loop here, basically I, I, I have a variable that I keep internally called mode. When you change the mode button, it increases this uh, between the values of zero, one, or two. And that just picks which axis it should use to measure. Uh, so it's gonna basically grab either the X, Y, Z axis, depending on the current mode, and grab the current acceleration. And it, this gives you back a value in meters per second squared. And then I just use linear interpolation to say, okay, for that acceleration value, it should be within some range, a min and a max range, which I said is defined here. So from negative 10 to 10 meters per second. So that's good for showing gravity. Um, you know, if you like threw this against the wall, uh, you'd see the max value, but you wouldn't see it like get brighter or lower, but you could tweak these values if you wanted to make this like 20, negative 20 to 20 or something like that. Uh, but then you'd really have to apply some force to see it change. But anyways, so it uses that acceleration. It figures out, you know, where is my acceleration within that range of min and max? And it uses that to scale a color, so the red component of the color between a min and a max. So the min color is basically just full red, and the max color is full blue, effectively. And so linear interpolation says, okay, you know, based on where this acceleration falls within some known range, generate a color value that's proportionally within a different range, so within the range of uh, red to blue colors here. So that's what these lines do. They just uh, interpolate using that current acceleration. And then I just loop through, just light up all the pixels to that color and then uh, and show them. And so if I go into the mode, so you can see, um, and let me change the Y axis. So when I change it, you know, when I move it left here, it's turning red, which basically means that my acceleration value here is pretty close to my minimum. So, you know, I must be getting a negative 10 value here, which makes sense because the Y axis is pointing down when I hold it in this orientation. So it's seeing, you know, 10 meters per second squared uh, towards earth, like down. Uh, and then if I flip it this way, you can see it turns blue. And so now the linear interpolation is basically seeing it's, you know, it's passing, it's getting a value of like 10 meters per second. It's like, you know, the opposite. So the, my Y axis is like facing down and gravity is going with it. So it's seeing 10 meters per second squared down. And that's uh, now the linear interpolation says, okay, you're closer to the max end of this range. 
So I'm going to give you a color that's, you know, from this max color uh, size up here. So, you know, basically this max color. So you can see it's basically giving me a blue color when I hold it like that. And when I hold it like straight, you know, in, in the middle here. So now it's getting kind of halfway in between negative 10 and uh, 10. It, like it should be getting zero right now, uh, effectively. And uh, at that point, then it's basically picking the color exactly in the middle of red and blue. So pink, uh, which you see there. So again, pretty simple, straightforward. You know, the mode press just cycles through the different uh, axes that you want to look at on there. But uh, real nice, you know, all the code is just in this file for it. And then the last one, the sensor demo, uh, real quick, I'll just kind of mention. So this one looks at, you know, the, the light sensor and the uh, temperature sensor. And so all I really do here in the loop for this, I just turn off the pixels, then I measure the light level. Again, I use linear interpolation and I say, okay, if my light is within some min and max range, then generate a value between zero and five, because that's how many pixels are on uh, the, each side. Like, you know, there are five pixels I'm using to light this up. And then just light up that number of pixels effectively from my interpolation. So, you know, as I put more shadow over this, if I'm kind of halfway in shadow on the light sensor, then it's only lighting up about half the pixels. But if I let all the light hit it, then it lights you know up all the pixels. And if I cover it up completely, they basically turn off uh, on there. And then same exact same uh, thing for the temperature sensor, you know, exact same code. But now I look at a minimum and maximum temperature range. And for this one, I set it up in the same kind of way where I have a couple different arrays. So I have my minimum and maximum light. So this is basically saying uh, in the current mode, the mode it starts out often, it uses a range from zero to 50 for the light sensor. So, you know, right now they're all lit up. So it's getting a value around 50 or it might even be higher than 50. But if I, if I cover up a lot of the pixels, then it's getting a lower value that's, you know, somewhere closer to like one or 10 or, you know, uh, way less than 50 in this case for it. So that's basically how I'm showing the ranges here. And when you press the mode button, it just swaps through the different values of zero, one, or two. And so that'll just pick which index inside of these arrays should it use, you know, zero, one, or two. And so you can see how the ranges increase as you press the button. So my light range goes from zero, zero to 50 at, to start with, goes to zero to 255, and then zero to 1023, which is kind of the full range of the analog uh, sensor values there. And then for temperature, I'm actually getting them back to temperature in Fahrenheit. So I'm using the Circuit Playground library has uh, a little temperature F function, which does the math to turn the thermistor value into a temperature uh, reading. So there's an equation you can apply to that. And again, it just applies a range of uh, values here. So by default, it's looking for the range of 80 to 85 degrees. And then if you increase the range, it goes from 70 to 90 degrees. And then if you increase it to the max, it goes from negative 32 to 212 degrees. So, you know, pretty much like the full range of uh, temperature values. Although hopefully this thing's not detecting 212 degrees Fahrenheit because that, that would be bad. Uh, so that's basically it for the demos. I just kind of wanted to walk through this uh, mega demo example and just show how you might approach a complex sketch like this and how to break it down. And I'll show you if I compile this, uh, it's actually kind of interesting. It uh, takes up about like 70, maybe 80% of memory. So yeah, here you go, 21,000 bytes, so 73% of memory. So I could still add a, another demo or two to this probably. Uh, you know, there's a little bit more of uh, flash memory left. But it's nice in that it's, you know, all of my code is just broken out into separate files here. Very easy to reason about. I can enable or disable different ones by just, you know, removing those from the list of demos inside of here. Um, and, and then, you know, each demo is kind of, it's up to that demo to figure out what it wants to do. Like if it wants to, you know, use all the sensors or maybe light up the pixels or play some music, something like that. Uh, very easy to, to add new stuff for that. So if folks have questions, uh, throw them into the chat and I'll see if I can get to them. Let's see, I'll change real quick to kind of the main view here. So let's see if there are any questions here. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, oh, okay, so let's see. Someone's asking, I installed Sleepy Dog and the Mega Demo and it freezes the board. I get a solid green LED to the right of the USB connector. Uh, uh, that's a little weird. You might double check and see, uh, is your computer supplying enough power? It almost sounds like it's not giving enough power for the board to boot up. 
um, and make sure because when it when it starts up it goes immediately into the rainbow cycle which uh, it only requires about 20 milliamps of power or so but that's something to check i mean maybe that's pulling a little more power than your uh, usb port is is providing uh, and then um, you know make sure that the switch is slid into the left position to turn it on and if you go into the right position that turns it off um, effectively for it so uh, but yeah, the sleeping is in the negative, the, the, the right position, and then the on is on the left, the positive position for it. Uh, let's see, what's a good way to learn these more advanced C++ techniques? Oh, uh, good question. Um, I'll show you a good resource. Um, this, this could be a whole stream in itself probably is uh, maybe uh, good C++ stuff. Let me go back to the desktop mode uh, for this one. Let's see, let's do that, let's do that. So let's see, I'll show you real quick. Um, so some good C++ resources. Um, there's a book, uh, I think it's called, it's by Bjarne Strustrup, which I think I got his name right. Uh, and it's, uh, oh man, I always forget the name. Uh, it's like, it's an introduction to C++. Let's see, let's go to, uh, let's see for his, uh, his books here. It's, uh, Boy, doesn't Amazon have, uh, I'm sure it'll be a link. So this is the classic, the C++ programming language. Uh, I wouldn't start with this book. This is like the definitive reference. Um, it's a great book. I have a copy of the third edition back there. It's, uh, it, it goes through in kind of, you know, normal writing. You could actually get, there's the, the ISO specification for C++. You don't want to read that though. That's uh, it's it's very dense. This takes all of the details from the C++ spec. You know, it's it's by the creator of the C++ language, Bjarne Bjarne Strustrup, and uh, he basically distills. You know, this is the language, but it's definitely written for someone who's familiar with programming. Uh, so you don't want to start with this. But he did make a smaller book, which uh, I am blanking on the title for here. But uh, let me find it. I know it's in here somewhere. If we look up Strustrup. Uh, it's under his name here, and it's, uh, ah, here it is, A Tour of C++. This is the one to check out. So check out this book. This is a good book. Uh, it basically introduces modern C++, which you might hear uh, modern C++ in the sense of like C++ in the last 10 years, because C++ is like a 30-year-old language, maybe even older than that. Uh, and a lot of things that we used to do 20 years ago, we don't have to do anymore. So in the last 10 years with uh, C++ 11 in particular, they added a lot of interesting stuff to the language. So start with this book. It's only like 100 pages. It's not long at all. It does assume that you know some basic programming. Like if you're familiar with Arduino and like using, you know, functions and variables and loops and stuff like that, then you'll be able to pick this up. And he kind of goes through from the start to finish. You know, here's how, here's all the features of C++. Um, it's not going to go in depth into object oriented stuff though. So uh, for that, that one's a little tougher. Uh, there was another book that I really liked. It's called Thinking in C++ uh, by uh, Bruce Eckel, I think was his name. Uh, oh, I'm searching the Kindle store. Let's search, uh, search everything in here. So let's do all departments. There we go. So this is the second book that I would recommend for C++. I'd say Thinking in C++. I really like this one. So this one's kind of halfway in between that tour of C++. If you think of tour of C++ as like small hundred page, uh, good for people that are familiar with programming and just want to pick up C++ versus the C++ programming language that I showed before. That's like five or 600 pages, very in depth. This is kind of in the middle where it's, you know, gives you most of the details of the language but very practical, tells you like, okay, here's what, here's how, you know, like uh, classes work and what a constructor is and a destru uh, destructor and, you know, when you want to use these and what they do. And uh, I found it great. Like, I, I really like this book and it really helped me learn when I was in college, uh, C++. Uh, so check it out. I think it's actually online too. If you search for thinking in C++, and I'll put these links down in the description, uh, I'm pretty sure that he put all these online that you can actually just see the PDF files for these. So worth checking out for sure. This is a really good one uh, for that. So uh, uh, let's see, what, what sort of uh, support does Sleepy Dog have for interrupts? Uh, it doesn't have any interrupt support. Uh, so the Sleepy Dog library, basically <clears throat> it can just go into deep sleep for a period of time and then uh, otherwise not. So it's, it's simple. It's more of an ab abstraction around the watchdog uh, timer that it, that it has. So. Uh, but that's it. I think that's it. So that's all the questions I had here. So we'll wrap this up. 
Um, and let's see, let me switch back to the main view here. Oops, go there. Uh, but yeah, great question about C++, uh, C++ stuff. Maybe in a future stream, I might try to do some beginner stuff because it it's, uh, takes a while to wrap your head around like classes, object orientation. I can totally uh, empath uh, empathize with beginners that are kind of learning this stuff. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, hopefully something that I can give you some good resources to look at. Uh, but I think you'll see in the end, uh, it, it's worth learning some of these techniques because it, it makes your code a lot easier to reason about and to look at. So anyways, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe to youtube.com slash Adafruit. You can watch this and all kinds of other fun project videos. Twitch.tv slash Adafruit. That's where I stream this live. I like to do a bunch of streams every week. So I have a Monday stream and a Friday stream. Although this Friday of uh, this week, I won't have a stream. And this Monday, I won't have a stream also. I'll be gone. I'll actually be out at uh, Maker Fair in the Bay Area. Uh, so uh, no streams for the next few days. But I'll be back uh, next week. I'll probably do one as soon as I'm back. So maybe mid next week, we'll see another stream. Uh, and hopefully I'll get some videos and things from Maker Fair. So I'll look for those on the, the YouTube channel. But like, comment, subscribe. Let us know that you like this stuff. Uh, and we'll keep making all this great stuff. Uh, and uh, check out all the great stuff at Adafruit.com. So thanks a lot. This is Tony from Adafruit. And I'll see you guys later.